Mm-hmm. Are you guys still kind of under quarantine a bit over there? Or? Um, it's a different. It's a difficult to say, really, because um, supposedly in the mainstream media we are, but um, sovereign, <laughs> steadfast beings are not. <laughs> yeah. Um, not being idiots, just getting sun and fresh air mm-hmm. as we're meant to to be, right. um, to stay healthy. Mm-hmm. Where in England are you? I'm uh, I'm in Hove, which is um, which is a part of Brighton. It's okay. the same place, really. It's just I don't know. You, you get slightly bigger places, I suppose, and it's a bit more family orientated. Mm-hmm. Um, Brighton's lovely though I mean we moved from New York we came back and we chose Brighton straight away mm-hmm. um, it's quite a while ago now <laughs> I thought you were still here or somewhere in the States not necessarily New York I thought you were still here no no we we moved back in um, in 2006 okay so yeah it's been a while it has yeah mm-hmm. and uh the family happened <laughs> in uh, <laughs> like two months after we came back. So um, it was meant to be then. Say what's that? It was meant to be then. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's good. How's right. it all going? Where you are then? Yeah, what, what it's going. Are you in? So I'm in a place called Midwood, um, which is uh, kind of like middle of Brooklyn. Like I yeah, I think my father's to- from there. Okay. Yeah, he's from around there. That's how mm-hmm. I got the dual nationality. Nice. Yeah, but he's he's been here longer than he was uh, born and bred out there. Oh, he moved there with you guys? Well, no, I mean, he, he met my mum when he was in the Air Force Station. Oh, okay. So he's in, in the UK, mm-hmm. um, which I'll men- mention later on because that has... Um, a little bit to do with with how I got into hip hop as well. Yeah, my husband's from Gloucester. Oh, okay, and his name's Dan as well, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. I have a lot of Dan's in my life right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and just a heads up. Um, hopefully it won't happen, but my four year old may come on the door. It's locked, so he won't come okay. into the frame. Yeah, and, um, and also a heads up to you as well. If you hear some, a bit of a, um, my daughter's hamster is in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> and he really wants to come out and he's chewing the bars and he's making oh, wow. a rack. He's all right now. I've <laughs> given him a walnut, so I should shut him up for a while. <laughs> <laughs> just just long enough. Yeah. Um, all right, so I think we can get started. This is Lara, a.k.a. The Sound Sommelier, talking with Dan Lish. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for talking to me. What's your yeah. earliest memory of hip-hop? Um, well, again, it was to do with my, my father being a Brooklynite, um, mm-hmm. it met my mother, you know, he stayed here. He used to take me to air bases uh, like Mildenhall and Lakenheath. They were American air bases mm-hmm. in Suffolk. And oh, okay. so I got little glimpses of it there, which I, I was very young, um, so I didn't really understand it. But it was, to be honest, it was the usual... Well, for me, uh, it, uh, in my generation, you'd see snippets on the television... Mm-hmm. And the show called Top of the Pops we played popular music and had strange people that were sort of um, just doing funny dances and stuff. And um, But then it would, the music, like Jeffrey Daniels or something on, on Top of the Pops, you know, Shalimar and uh, Rocksteady. And this, this is in the early 80s, so it was like 80, 82, 83, mm-hmm. um, when I was, I had gorgeous locks of, ginger hair <laughs> you seem to miss those I'm, I'm guessing what's that i said you seem to miss those no i don't really i just okay. I'm pretty, yeah it's so much easier to look after but yeah. i would think my, so. my mum does my mum misses them oh. why, why do you shave your hair stop shaving your hair you know all that <laughs> stuff. anyway that's that's how i got into it um top and, of the pops kind of yeah, and friends that had connections because I was in a little a little town called Thetford, Norfolk at the time. It was mm-hmm. in Thetford, based in Norfolk. Um, you know, parents split up, 
my dad remarried, ended up in Thetford. It's a bit of a shithole. Yeah. Um, got into hip hop around that time because of the TV mm-hmm. little snippets you'd see, and also my friends um, that had connections with London um, and the air bases. So it's all, it all sort of came together really, and um, you're so you're, you're like a little sponge. Um, mm-hmm. at that age you're just sucking up all sorts of of stuff around your environment and it's it's really hard i mean i get into the depths of it i'll talk about my book later on but um mm-hmm. i get into the i get quite philosophical i wear my philosophical hat in the introduction of the, of this book about how and and just the, the sort of vibe in the country at the time mm-hmm. where it was under quite a it's just, just a nasty government. I mean, not, not much has changed. You know, I won't get on my soapbox box now, but you know what I mean, I, it's just, I feel like we're both dealing with some interesting government issues right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so at the time, you know, um, late seventies, early eighties, uh, you know, England, it was just a, a bit depressing, and a, and this colourful, rich cultural nugget came into our view and was like, what? The- is that you know what I mean and and so that's yeah it was like a a revolution really in dance the art the music the sonics you know the the fashions Mm -hmm. completely different and it was rebellious for me as as I guess an Anglo-European because you'd get a lot of inverse racism as well like why are you listening to that nigger music and and what are you doing that for and I was like you know what I mean I didn't give a a monkeys and I, I was just going to go for it and I felt it and I just ran with it and I had that obsession for, for a very long time. <laughs> so how old would you say you were when that happened? Uh, 13, mm-hmm. 14, yeah, you know, yeah. I was yeah. born in 71, so. Okay. Um, are you drinking PG tips? <laughs> um, Ten years ago, I would have said yes. This is Earl Grey. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, Red Bush as well. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Too. Um, what are you currently listening to? Whether it be uh, genres or artists or certain yeah, records. I mean, or... um, I gave this a good listen today. This is this is great. This is Oxygen. Mm. Uh, age appropriate. That that was that was really good. Mm-hmm. Uh, He's, I think he's based in, no, he's, he's Long Island. He'll, he'll kick me for saying if he was uh, BK, but yeah, he's Long Island. And um, that is very good <laughs> for promotion because I did the cover, but the, the album's great. I mean, it's like they're both in, in like I would say, a traditional sound. You know, if it's 20 years ago, you'd probably say True School or, t- or t- 25, 25 years. Um, but it, it's, it's more a traditional sounding. Mm-hmm. Um, some kids are saying, oh, that's some, you know, it just sounds old school. But to me, it's just that tri- traditional sounding um, vibe, which I, it resonates still, you know, with me today. So, but I mean, I don't know, there's, um, I listen to jazz, I mean, even classical music uh, sometimes, if I'm in that mood. Mm-hmm. Um, tall Black Guy, Stro Elliott. Joe Ron Bombay's uh, mixtapes because he, he takes the original mixtapes from you know the the Bronx sound systems, you know, Cold Crush or Fantastic or whatever, and, and just re edits them in an amazing way and just um, edits them in, or, or should I say, not remixes them, but keeps the flavor intact. But he just takes you on a marvelous journey. But yeah, I'll, I'll check those out. And Jay Period's mixes, I'm working with him quite a bit but it's opened me up a lot of his soundscapes he's been doing as well um robert glasper you know there's there's a lot there's a lot of stuff you know more more on that jazz tip i'd say nowadays um i mean i don't really dig deep as Mm -hmm. i used to because you've only got so much time and energy right you know especially being a family man Mm -hmm. um young daughters you know i'm outnumbered now it's just me and pip the hamster we're the only males in the house so i mean you know it's only so much energy to go around 
Um, <laughs> but yeah, there's, 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 a, there's a lot of music still, but I'm not obsessive as I was because I would dig deep and, you know, have that testosterone fuel trophy hunting head on. You know, like, yeah, I've, I found this. I mean, I still love beats, like break beats, just a deep, mm. raw DJ cutting up break beats, just doubling up. It's just, it's just my cup of tea, as they say, you know, it's just really, I still, I still love that just rawness of it. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever dabble in DJing? Yeah, yeah, I did. In, in, um, I did pirate radio for about eight, nine years in, in the UK. Um, got busted once, and luckily we had a backup box full of like Duran Duran and, and just <laughs> the old pop music that they took. They took all the equipment, but I begged them because I was unemployed at the time, and I used to spend all my money that I did hustle up on, on vinyl, and they were all imported from America. And I begged them just if I could keep my wax and they just took all the equipment in that crap box. Um, but yeah, did that and um, did, you know, nightclubs, jams, did stuff in New York with uh, King Up Rock and Dynasty Rockers. Um, we did um, dollar jams and b-boy jams, up rock contests and still keeping that root cool, you know, style and, and, and flavor really, not really. I did a lot of stuff, man. It's, it's, you know, you're taking me back now. But yeah, I did this thing called the Go Off. I started that night on the south coast of England. And we used to get B-boys. That's when we was trying to fuse all the elements, bring them all back again. It was that true school thing again, you know, in the, in the mid to late 90s. Um, so we used to get Axe Down. Um, at company Flow at local, a lot of hardcore crews from um like mud family from london and um got to give a shout to ali as well who was my partner in that as well uh he had the connections for a lot of uk um sorry us groups so you know we'd, we'd get them off the um off the circuit if they were performing in london you know but um yeah so sorry i'll, I'll probably no <laughs> no that's totally fine i appreciate it um were you ever a fan not were you ever a fan, but were you a fan of UK hip hop as well, or was it kind of you were just more into America? To be to be honest, I mean I was, but I I was a fan of of I love UK hip hop, but mm -hmm. uh, it always had that sort of Yankee sort of like twang to it. Mm -hmm. Realizing like Demon Boys, Hijack, all these old crews, and then I moved out to America, came back. Uh, and everyone's speaking in their 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 tongue. They're like traditional, like you know what I mean. But mm -hmm. I didn't. It didn't sound. It didn't. I, I was just brought up with that rootical New York sound, and that's what I love, and I always will. Right. So the the new crews, they're probably very talented, but I'm not. To be honest, I'm not really looking out for the sound. And if I hear it, I respect it and the lyricism. Mm -hmm. But it just doesn't really float my boat. That's you know? okay. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out, and I just, pff, <laughs> just doesn't really do it. And there's so many strains, and UK hip hop is very strong right now. Right. But I'm just more into, you know, the, the New York, especially. I mean, I'm York. not going to hit on that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so you mentioned Norfolk. Um, did you grow up around there? Would you say or? Well, I was, um, it's, it's Suffolk where I was born and bred in Bury St. Edmunds. It's very rural. Um, that's where my folks uh, brought me up. And, then, and that's where you went to school? or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and when, like I say, my, my parents, my mum and dad split up when I was at that delicate age of about 10 when mm -hmm. you need that. <laughs> when you need stability, yeah. stability and your hormones are going crazy and your brain's <laughs> being rewired and uh, yeah so um that wasn't nice um and i moved to thetford um but that's where i got into hip-hop there so it's right. always it's just a, a i wouldn't say a special place in my heart because i go back there and it is a bit of a dumb um <laughs> but i talk about that in in the book and everything and you know, get into the nitty gritty, really. So, right. um, so when did art come into the picture? Were you artistic in school, or? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's runs on my mother's side. Um, she told me that my seventh great 
granddad or no uncle, which which is like I, I'm really awful with the dates, but it's seventeen hundreds or something like that. It was Sir, Sir Joshua Reynolds, and he was the first president in the Royal Academy of Art and painted royalty and all that. And you know, I'm a bit. I should really research it, but uh, I'm cool. You know, it's just yeah. Uh, yeah he's got his statue up in London and. Yeah, my mum told me about that, so I was a little bit ignorant to it. And I should research it, and I will at some point, but I think that's where the artistic flair comes from, is on my mother's right. side. Um, uh, where, how did, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying, so I, I was always known for the, you know, the lad that was always drawing, and I did it for escapism, you know, difficult family situations and stuff, right. and just to just to get out there really. And um, I had, I always had a good, um, terrible with words and t I got ungraded in maths, dyslexic, mm -hmm. but visual imagery, I could hold that for a long time. Um, so I'm good with faces, but terrible with names. <laughs> Can't yeah. be good at everything. I'm yeah. awful at math too, so. <laughs> um, did your, how did your environment influence your art growing up? Well, as I was saying, it was, um, it, it did involve, if I was in a, a bad, well, not a, a place where it was, um, the environment was, was challenging through family situations or um, it was a little bit, um, oh, what's the word, not, not toxic, but sort of sterile, mm -hmm. I would go into fantasy land and that's that's what we that's what we all should do really we should, mm -hmm. you know create and explore these these wonderful realms and um so that's what i did and so it, it, it affected me in a way where um if you're bored and you, you know, you're lacking stimulus as a young boy you're gonna maybe go maybe i was a bit introverted and um mm -hmm. express myself through my drawing and I think that's why hip hop helped so much because it it got me out of my shell as well and made me more confident, mm -hmm. um, which is 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 hard to explain really because that was from a boy's perspective. Obviously, it's completely different now. Uh, um, so you say you draw inspiration from everyday life and working with creative people. Can you give examples? Um, it's just meeting just decent, open-minded people. Um, it's, uh, I can't really give, I mean, the artists that I work with as well, um, if, if they're really good at their craft mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm doing a different type of craft, you know, we have that same creative flair for that sort of unique human journey where you're, you're creating something and you may be lucky enough to make a living out of it it's nice just to talk to people that make music and and our, our craft workers in, the, in their own right so that's what i mean about that really and knowing your fellowship and um or finding your fellowship with sort of just decent forward thinking sovereign people which is quite important i think in this this day and age just to to find um, not just your truth, but the truth in, in others and honesty and um, obviously being grounded as well. Um, but yeah, just having that, um, oh, it's really hard to explain. I don't want to get, I don't want to get too philosophical right now. No, that's okay. Yeah, it's, um, these are the people that influence me and nature as well is, is such a big thing for me just to go out into the hills or swim in the sea every day. Mm -hmm. although that's you know that's not really answering your question but. no that's fine any kind of inspiration that's fine yeah I, I, um i think i've said i think i've answered that okay i mean it's a it's a big question it's huge mm -hmm. um it would take a lot of thought but yes sorry i'm waffling on that's so fine so you specialize in illustration video game concept art wall art do you have a preference for any of those or are there any others that I'm left off that you want to... No, that's cool. I mean, um, it's all artwork. It's all creativity in the end. And although, you know, I'm, I'm an artist, um, 
I guess the commercial word is illustrator. And because I've been, as my main bread and butter, uh, working for the video game industry for 20 odd years now, um, that's just another part of illustration to me. You can call it what you want. That's just, it's the same as in the movies. If you're creating characters and environments, you're a concept artist and that's what they'll label you, but you're still an artist, you're an illustrator. So um, I do, I used to be completely obsessed with, uh, you know, graffiti as well, uh, as that came in that nice package, you know, with, with all the elements of hip hop. But, um, I've slowly sort of, I just realized that was, um, it was an ode to New York, the, the New York flavor of graffiti and, and the whole rebellious nature of it. And, I, and it was me, but now that I'm older and more mature, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, and I do still do wall murals, but I wouldn't say it's graffiti anymore mm -hmm. or spray can art or whatever you want to label it. It's not breaking down letter forms and all this. It's more just character based and things inspired out of my sketchbook. So I still do that, which I love. Um, but illustration, picking up a pen. I haven't got a good example of a pen, but you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. that's the best for me. You can just pull it out of your pocket, sit down, get in that lovely little zone and just, just, you know, just go for it. And, and that's all you need. You need an instrument just to make a mark on a surface and that's cool that's i'm right there if it's too much faffing about that's the thing with, with graffiti at the time i was like oh man i've got to arrange and get all my colors i've got to do it in my black book and it just and then i've got to go out and if it's illegal i've got to really scope the place out and like <laughs> then i've got to call up some of my friends just to, to spot me as well i'm doing it's so much hassle just mm -hmm. give me a pen and a bit of paper <laughs> huh? you, i mean I'd, I'd love to get into um, back into oil painting and all that as well. But yeah, again, you're spreading yourself thin. So I'm just going to focus on my ink work for now, bringing mm. a bit of watercolor and mixed media now and again. I mean, I'm in a good place. Right. Um, when you approach a piece, how do you decide on your colorways? Uh, I just experiment. Some, sometimes I have, I have specific colors that I'm, I'm sort of drawn to mm -hmm. like a aquas and, um, turquoise and and sort of powder pinks and you know i really like those those um, those clashes but then i then I'll, I'll be doing it too much and i have to change it and go a bit earthy or um sometimes with the inks and i'm trying to color it um when i first started the ego strip illustrations um they were very subdued i didn't really want to give big bold colors i, I like to keep it really earthy Mm -hmm. And um, so it was more of an, a gesture. The color was more of a gesture, but the color is is getting a bit more flamboyant the last two years. But it's experimentation, you know. Uh, in your opinion, do you have any consistent elements in your pieces where someone could, without seeing your name, could someone look at something and be like, that's a Danlish because X? Um. I mean, pff, I, I guess it's ink. It's just the cross hatching. It's the style that I, I, I just try and uh, f uh, create a form, a structure within line, mm -hmm. and that's it. Instead of just going cross hatch, cross crack, that's the shading. I'll, I'll, I'll pick at the the structure. <laughs> it's really hard to explain. Um, <laughs> and your nose, eyes, eye sockets. Uh, everything is a little structure that you have to sort of craft and um so that i you know that that's that's my style of of my ink technique um okay. usually i have um top down lighting so the light is coming down casting a shadow so if i'm freestyle i can just do it with that in my head where i know where the shadows are going to fall on a surface you know it might be a chin um over the top of a wrist with a pen, you know mm -hmm. where the shadows are going to fall. And the, you know, it's just learning about the structures, keeping them in your head and just churning them out. Uh, so I'm lucky I can just think of it. And I like anthropomorphizing um, speakers and just equipment that 
you know, I mean, I love, I love all that and just making characters out of it, pushing what I can do. What will an old turntable look if it's like an old man mixed mm -hmm. with a, a turntable mm -hmm. or, or an eight track or something? Then he's going to be very old and knackered and with a cane. And I just like having fun with it. It's that cheeky sort of rebellious sort of fun. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's that's what people maybe pick up on what I do. I can see that. Mm -hmm. Um, so you've created content for brands like Sony, LucasArts, Rockstar Games, and you played a major role in the DJ Hero franchise. Can you share any insights on working with those companies as a whole or on an individual basis? Any stories you want to share? I mean, it's, all, it's a buzz working with big companies, but um, it can be tricky because um, but it seems like the more corporate they are, the more, not inhuman, I would say, but... Uh, you know, um, it's, it's, you haven't got that freedom. Well, right. I'm really speaking. They are. Yeah, they're very specific and, and there's a hard line. There's a line. You can't really step over that line. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite rare. I mean, nowadays I'm, I'm, I'm quite lucky. It's happening a lot more, but I think that comes with experience and confidence as well. Maybe that's it. But, um, I mean, working with, with the, some of these big companies, like it, it's a buzz, uh, and, that sort of you sort of get carried away with the sort of excitement but then when you're halfway through the project it, it's like it's quite a slog um i'm not being very specific it's just very it varies a lot. It, it does vary um there can be some quite awful companies i've worked with mention no names hmm. um but it's still good experience because you learn to be humble but not take any crap as well you know so a lot of humility and just try and it's it's negotiation as well you learn to negotiate a bit thoroughly and and try not to get emotionally triggered if someone's an asshole. <laughs> <I mean, laughs> yeah it builds up your tolerance yeah, which I didn't have a lot of back then. <laughs> I've got a lot more now. <laughs> yeah. Understood. Um, so you've also worked with other mediums, comic book illustrations, album art, toy design. What draws you to any particular project? And can you work on multiple at the same time? Yeah, I okay. can. It's, it's, uh, um, it's a challenge, but I, it, it, I work fast and um, I, I don't dither about with too many roughs. I just know what's in my head, get it out there. And I'd say I'm lucky it's like 90% of the time it's on point. And so you can just, and it's just a nice smooth process. Um, sorry, you're gonna have to repeat the question again. No, that's totally fine. <laughs> it's, I just asked like, what draws you, like if, if your approach to do a comic book or a toy design, yeah, yeah. what yeah. do you need to see in order to be like, yes, I definitely wanna work on that project? Well, if the person is, is a nice person, um, they're just respectful and, and humble and, you know, it's that mutual niceness. You know, mm -hmm. we, we're working to a goal. We're, we're creative. Let's work together. If someone's going to be an arsehole, it's not going to work. Or if they're going to be, I don't know, it's, it's, it's like, um, what do you mean by an arsehole? But, you, you know, you get the point. I know what you mean. And the project has just got to be really cool. Um, I think um, when I was a lot younger, I would take everything and anything on mm -hmm. and, and I would stretch myself too thin and I'll think, yeah, this is cool for the experience, but it, in the, it wasn't, it wasn't really um, favorable to my mental health. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's just a cool project, exciting and good people. 